My name is Danny. This is Ale and Agony. Welcome on in. Let's get cosy and talk about murder. And you guys, we have a brand new Patreon member, Natalie Smith, you beautiful bean. Thank you so much for supporting the show. This week's episode is actually one of their recommendations. So I really hope that I do it justice for you. You may have noticed that Apple Podcasts still have us listed twice, but I am talking to them about it and we're trying to merge the two listings into a nice happy little family. So hopefully next week it will all be gravy baby. And before we get into today's case, let's start with the ale of this week's episode. And I'm drinking the highly anticipated, well, by me, anyway, <laughs> the special Tony Chocoloni and Brewdog collaboration that is the Raspberry Milkshake IPA that came in the subscription box this month. And I know that some of you have just curled up inside at the thought of it, but others out there, they're salivating at the idea. <laughs> so get yourself cosy, because I'll be telling you today about the case of Catherine Knight. So let's crack it open. If you don't know about Catherine Knight or what she did, then good for you. Congratulations. <laughs> but here in the world of true crime, it is an infamous case and one that many new podcasts talk about quite early on because it's pretty juicy. So today we're going down under to Australia. And I promised myself I wouldn't do that, but I just can't help it. I mean, can you say that phrase, like going down under? <laughs> like you just, it can't be done and I'm so sorry. Catherine Knight was born in Tenterfield, New South Wales. Not like Wales, Wales, but New South Wales in Australia. On the 24th of October, 1955, to Barbara Ruffin, or Rowan? I think Ruffin, and Ken Knight, and she was born with her non-identical twin sister, Joy. And we need to go back to before Catherine was born, as there is some juicy gossip that you need to know first. So, in a small town called Aberdeen, not Scotland, in New South Wales, not Wales, <laughs> Barbara was previously married to a man called Jack Ruffin, or Rowan. They had four boys together, and the story goes that this was a very small, close-knit town. And it was a traditional time back in the 40s and 50s. So something like an affair back then was super scandalous. And when I say scandalous, I mean like it was life-ruining, especially when you live in a small, close-knit community. So silly old Babs started flirting with her husband's colleague, Ken Knight. And when Jack found out, he threw her out of the house immediately. And because of the height of the scandal, none of her sons wanted to speak to her and they disowned her. So Barbara had no choice but to move in with her new lover, Ken. And the local backlash of the scandal meant that they had to move out of Aberdeen. And could you imagine that now, like knowing that, you know, someone's having an affair and then pressuring them that much in society that they felt the need to move. I know people that have had affairs and I don't think that they've been shunned from their community. Times had changed though. And at first things seemed to be going okay. One of the things that Barbara liked about Ken was his fun nature. And normally they'd be meeting up after dark and sneaking around. But now they're spending all of their time together and it became very clear that Ken had a drinking problem. This quickly escalated to Ken beating Barbara. And if Barbara wasn't in the mood for sex, then Ken would literally force himself on her and rape her, reportedly up to 10 times a day. So Barbara's left her happy marriage. Well, it clearly wasn't happy, but she left her 
easy marriage to run away with this new man. Her children have also abandoned her, and now this is her life. She'd probably be feeling quite shit. And at this point, Barbara had already had four children with Jack, but her and her new lover Ken went on to have four more, and two of which were twin baby girls, Joy and Catherine. Catherine grew up in a super dysfunctional home. Her mother Barbara just never left the house and she had no friends as such and she would just stay at home and be the typical wife and cook and clean and repair clothes and she would often confide in her daughters about Ken. Barbara would tell them all the explicit details of her and Ken's sex life and tell them how shitty Ken was and how he would use her for sex. Imagine your mum telling you sordid details about your dad and what sexual things he forced her to do against her will. Grim. In 1959, Barbara's ex-husband Jack passed away and two of her sons from the marriage moved in with her and the family. Catherine's new stepbrothers would unfortunately go on to sexually abuse Catherine up until she was around 11 years old. And although there are doubts about the exact details, psychiatrists have accepted her claims and the events have also been largely confirmed by members of her own family. So Catherine has had a fucking rough start to life. She's been told by her mother that men are shit and she just gets told in detail of the sexual abuse that her mum is subjected to. And apparently Ken would rape Barbara regardless of if the children were in the room or if they were in ear's reach. So Catherine's first view of men is from her mother and essentially women are slaves and we're just here to please men. You're here to cook their meals, you're here to clean their house, and you're here to fuck them however they want to be fucked, regardless of whether or not you want that. Then Catherine's two new half-brothers arrived on the scene, and they are likely seeing what Ken is up to in the house. And so they follow his lead, and then they pick Catherine as their perfect target. So essentially Catherine has been told that Men only want women for sex, and then is subjected to that fact. And if you're thinking to yourself, poor Barbara, you know, she must have had a terrible life. She's gone from having, you know, a boring but stable marriage into having this awful relationship. Like, yes, of course, it is awful. But don't feel too bad for her. Because... Catherine later on went to her mum for some advice because one of her boyfriends wanted her to take part in a particular sexual act and she didn't want to perform it. So Bab's golden advice to her daughter was put up with it and stop complaining. Good job there, mum. Well done. (laughs) During her education, Catherine did have some recorded violent incidents as she went through school. She didn't have many friends and was described as being a bit of a bully to the younger and smaller kids in school. She also once assaulted a young boy with a blade and she later went on to have an altercation with her teacher and it ended with the teacher physically striking Catherine all in self-defense. And after school, Catherine went on to work in a clothing factory for a short time before she landed what she described was her dream job which was working in the local abattoir. And she started off her career working in the offal section. Anyone that doesn't know, offal is the internal organs and entrails of animals that we use in food. So if you think of liver pate or blood black pudding, sausage casings, all those good tasty things, But Catherine was soon excelling, and she was a total workhorse. She was also a strong woman. She was over six foot, and she had a pretty strong, solid build. And she really loved what she did. 
She was soon running rings around all the other workers that had been there for a fair few years. And this was quickly recognised, and she was very soon promoted to work in the boning section, where she was given her very own set of knives. And in her new role, she would need to remove the bones from carcasses, and she would also need to cut standard and premium cuts of meat. So sharp blades were essential. And she really treated these knives as an extension of herself. And she was known to spend at least 10 minutes before every shift sharpening and cleaning her knife set. Catherine loved her knives so much that she would then take them home with her after every shift. And she had a little hook above her bed where she would hang them and admire them. She liked having them nearby and she said, they would always be handy if I ever needed them. The idea of laying in bed and staring up at the tips of my very, very sharp knife set hanging above my head sounds fucking horrifying. Catherine was known around town to have a good time and often met with her co-workers in the local pub after their shifts. And at 18 years old, Catherine started dating her co-worker, David Kellett. And much like her mother, Barbara, Catherine picked herself a man who was a heavy drinker. And I wonder if this was a case of like, oh, this is what I grew up with, this was in the household, this is what I want, or this is what I need, or maybe it's a case of like, this is what I'm worthy of. Because I would have thought that maybe she would want to sort of steer opposite of her dad. But who knows? David had lost previous jobs because of his drinking problems, so he was a serious drinker. And because of his drunken shenanigans, he often got himself into bar fights. But do not worry, because his aggressive and fist-throwing red-headed lover was by his side. That's right, Catherine was known for fist-fighting with other men and hurling abuse at anyone who crossed her. So she was always there to swing a few punches on drunken David's behalf. What a team. Catherine and David got married the following year. But before the wedding, good old mum of the year, mother of the blushing bride Babs, pulled David to one side and told him, quote, You better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll fucking kill you. She's got a screw loose somewhere. End quote. That's lovely. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> David didn't take Barbara seriously. And only a few hours later, he would understand what she meant all too well. It was their wedding night. David had been drinking and having the time of his life. And as the night drew to a close, it was time to consummate that marriage. And Catherine was a wild bitch in the bedroom. She did everything in her power to make sure that her partner had the best time. Even though she personally didn't really enjoy sex. She thought it was her duty as a wife to just suck it up. Excuse the pun. And keep David happy. So they had sex. And shortly after... Catherine hopped back on, and they went at it again. And then again, for a third time. And when Catherine went in for round four, she couldn't get David hard, and she started to get frustrated. I mean, the poor little thing is probably all drained and shriveled up, but Catherine was having none of it. And she asked David what was wrong, and she didn't get a reply. So she grabbed his shoulders, and she shook him and out popped a little snore from a sleeping David. And Catherine was fucking livid. Poor David was awoken from his drunken slumber with his new wife Catherine on top of him, strangling him. Absolutely outraged that they only had sex three times. And I know plenty of people that did not have sex on their wedding night because they were both so hammered. So the fact that she's outraged about three times, I think that she's a bloody lucky lady. But do you know why this was so distressing to her? 
because her mum had told her that her and Ken consummated their marriage five times and they needed to have sex at least five times or more. Like, how fucking creepy. Like, you wake up and your new wife is on top of you, strangling you, berating you because you haven't fucked her as much as her dad fucked her mum on their wedding night. Like, it's just disgusting. David didn't accept the warnings from Barbara, and he wasn't fazed by the fact that his 19-year-old wife tried to strangle him to death in his sleep. He stuck around. And over time, it became apparent that the one thing that Catherine hated above everything else was feeling like she was being abandoned. And this feeling manifested in particular when David came home late. Even one minute late would set Catherine off into a rage and she would convince herself that David was cheating on her. So when he did eventually get in, all hell would break loose. And this got significantly worse when Catherine fell pregnant with her first child. The idea of being abandoned as a single mother absolutely terrified her. One night in particular, David was down the pub with some mates at a darts tournament, and it was overrunning. And when he got home late, Catherine had been sat in the dark, waiting for him. She'd just been sat there, just thinking over exactly what she was going to do to him and what he'd been up to and she was just stewing on the fact that he was sleeping with someone else and she was absolutely beside herself with rage. So when David got home, he saw all the lights were off and he assumed that Catherine had gone up to bed early, which was becoming a bit of a habit now that she was so heavily pregnant. So David walked towards the kitchen, he was going to grab himself his dinner, when Catherine smashed him full force in the back of the head with a frying pan, just like out of Tom and Jerry. And she hit David so hard that she severely fractured his skull and David lost consciousness. And when he came around, he pressed no charges. Unfortunately, Catherine's supposedly fictional fantasies of David having an affair are actually true. And in May, 19, I guess that's meant to say 1969, not 1769. What a bloody typo that is. And in May 1969, two years after their marriage, David left Catherine with their newborn daughter, Melissa Ann, and he moved away to Queensland with his new pregnant girlfriend. Catherine was, we know, not the most stable person. The day after David left, she was seen having a clear mental break. She was walking baby Melissa down the street in her pram and she was shouting at the baby and violently throwing the pram from side to side. And a concerned onlooker called the police in fear for the baby. Catherine was then diagnosed with postnatal depression, which is super common and so, so many people struggle with that after having a baby. And with Catherine's other mental health issues, it must have been a really dangerous environment for baby Melissa. Catherine spent several weeks recovering in St Elmo's Hospital, and baby Melissa was looked after by Nanny Barbara and Grandad Ken. And once Catherine was released, she was given Melissa back. But when Melissa was only two months old, Catherine would lay her screaming child on the local train tracks and walk off back into town and never look back. But don't worry, because luckily for baby Melissa, a local man called Old Ted was looking for food that he could forage down by the tracks when he heard a baby crying, and he saved her from certain death. And whilst Old Ted was saving the baby, Catherine was in the middle of town with an axe threatening to kill everyone, literally everyone. Anyone she saw, she swung that axe. She was going to murder everybody. And so she was sent back to St Elmo's, and after only one day she signed herself out and was released. How she was not charged with attempted murder is absolutely beyond me. I do know that she was quite the force to be reckoned with in the town. Like, she had a massive reputation. A lot of people were scared of her. So maybe the local police just didn't want to know or didn't know how to deal with the situation. I don't know, but there's no record whatsoever of her 
having any kind of legal repercussions of leaving her baby on a train track. Less than a week after her release from her second stay at St Elmo's, Catherine ran over to her neighbour's house and was crying that her baby was sick and really needed to get to the hospital. The neighbour was a young woman who was babysitting her younger brother, but she wanted to help a sick baby. So she agreed, and they all got in the car, and once inside the car, Catherine said that they needed to go to Queensland. And I've had a look on Google Maps, and that is a 17-hour drive. So the young woman was, of course, like, the fuck. I can't drive all night. I literally have my younger brother to look after. I thought we were going to the local hospital. But Catherine was not taking no for an answer. And she had one of her trusty knives with her. And she cut the young woman across the face and told her that they were going to Queensland so that Catherine could kill her ex, David, along with his mother. The young woman agreed, but said that she needed to get to a petrol station first if they were going to drive for 17 hours. And while she was filling up the tank, she raised the alarm. But Catherine took the young woman's brother hostage at knife point. But luckily she was eventually apprehended by the local police, whilst being hit with brooms kindly provided by the petrol station. So after all of this, leaving her baby on the train tracks cutting a woman's face, taking a young boy hostage, expressing her plans to murder her ex-husband and his mother, Catherine would be going to prison for a long time. Only kidding! No jail time for Catherine. She was instead admitted to a psychiatric hospital. The police then got in touch with David and they were like, hey, your life's in danger, friend. This crazy bitch back in Aberdeen literally plotted to murder you and your mum. And David decided that the best thing to do was to pack up all of his stuff along with his mum and move back to Aberdeen to look after Catherine. You see, David blamed himself for Catherine's mental break and thought that it was all his fault for cheating on her and he wanted to make it right. Like, okay, be a dum-dum and go back to the horny but stabby Cathy, but please leave your poor mum at home. And now he's just abandoning his other pregnant girlfriend. Like, he's, he's a bad guy. Either way you look at it, like, bad man. And with the promise of David and his mother keeping an eye on Catherine and ensuring that she took her medication, she was released into their care. And David moved himself, his mother, Catherine, and their baby Melissa to a new home near Brisbane. And Catherine took up a new job at the Dinmore Meatworks. And she was back in a cosy abattoir. And she had with her her trusty set of knives. And on the 6th of March in 1983, now 28-year-old Catherine and David welcomed their new daughter, Natasha Marie. And less than a year later, a fed-up Catherine got bored of David and her settled life. And she fucking left him. <laughs> She just packed up with her two kids and fucked off without even telling him. She went back to Aberdeen and David was a free man. Isn't that insane? People can't even be a minute late or she will literally brain them. But she's allowed to just literally up and leave and move out and say goodbye forever with no previous discussion. Like, okay, yeah, no whoppers. So Catherine went back to Aberdeen and she took up her old job at the abattoir. But she did her back in whilst lifting something heavy, was awarded a disability pension, and the government gave her a housing commission residence in Aberdeen. So she wasn't working anymore, and she was at home with her kids all the time, and she was getting pretty bored. So she started popping down the local pub again when the abattoir workers got off their shifts, and she started talking to a new David. David Saunders. David Saunders didn't work at the abattoir. He was a 38-year-old miner who was passing through town. But he soon became smitten with Catherine, as she always acted like the perfect woman. She was super eager to please David's sexual appetite. And she would cook and clean and repair his work clothes. And he was feeling like a lucky guy. Catherine was seven years younger than him, and he was the cat who got the cream. But soon, 
Catherine's alter ego would start to come to the surface, accusing him of cheating on her when he was late home. And she would often kick him out. And they constantly argued about the fact that he still kept his old flat. Catherine wanted him to get rid of it. Like, why did he need it? If he wasn't sleeping with other women, there's no need for him to have another apartment. Clearly he's got it because he's banging all these other women there. And David came home late one night and he found Catherine in the back garden holding his eight-week-year-old puppy by the scruff of the neck. And Catherine said if he ever cheated on her, she would kill him. And to prove how serious she was, disclaimer, this is about to get uncomfy, Catherine took one of her knives and she sliced the puppy's throat and her knives were so sharp that she nearly decapitated the puppy in one slash. She then went on to hit David over the head with yet another frying pan and funnily enough, David noped the fuck out and he went back to his flat and he literally hid out there for a few weeks. Like, yay David, you did the sensible thing, good for you. But Catherine was persistent. And she kept coming and knocking on the door. And she was crying and apologising and begging for forgiveness. Which David would give to her. The idiot moved back in with her. He sold his flat just like she wanted. And then they had Catherine's third daughter, Sarah. Which prompted them to put down a deposit on a house. And Catherine was so excited to have her first home that was actually hers, and she took no time at all to start decorating it. And her accessories of choice were taxidermy, hoping no boobs stuffed with sawdust, along with animal skulls, horns, rusty animal traps, machetes, rakes, pitchforks, all that good stuff. And even the ceiling wasn't safe because that's where the majority of the rakes were mounted. And I will post a photo on Instagram of the ceiling of the home. It's bizarre. Then Catherine and David number two would go on to have an almighty argument. And it resulted in Catherine smashing an iron into David's face. And she then also stabbed him in the stomach with a pair of scissors, all of which would permanently disfigure him. David did not press charges against Catherine because he was terrified of her. So he fled and went into hiding. And several months later, David would come back to Aberdeen to collect his baby Sarah. But Catherine was so outraged at him abandoning her that she filed an apprehended violence order against him and claimed that he had been beating her. So as soon as he rocked up in Aberdeen, the police were like, mate, you need to get out or you're going to be arrested. So David fled. And that's now two Davids down. But Catherine didn't wait very long before she was back in the bars and met a new man. But not another David. Oh, no, no. But a John. A John Chillingworth. And John was one of the local abattoir workers and his family had lived in the area for over 60 years. So the Chillingworths were well known in Aberdeen. And John's family were very vocal about not wanting Catherine's reputation being associated with their family. But too bad for Mama Chillingworth, because only a few weeks later, John and Catherine were pregnant. And they went on to have a son that they named Eric. But throughout the relationship, Catherine switched from physical abuse to mind games. You see, John was actually bigger than Catherine, Historically, her partners had been smaller than her, so both the Davids were easy for her to physically abuse. So Catherine would plant seeds of doubt in John's head about whether Eric was or was not his child. She'd be like, oh yeah, he could totally be yours, or he may be yours, but I'm not entirely sure. And after three years of dishing out this mental abuse to John, in October 1993, Catherine met a new man. Another John, 38-year-old John Price. And if you know this case, you know that the finale is coming. So Catherine started an affair with new John and eventually left old John. The double standards of this woman is insane. Like, 
you can't leave me, you can't possibly be a minute late home, otherwise I'm gonna think you're abandoning me, but I will literally take our children and leave in the middle of the night with no discussion. And then you can't possibly keep your flat because you must be banging other women, but I can cheat on someone else, that's fine. It's just ridiculous. So New John was yet another heavy drinker, and he was well loved by many friends. And fun fact, up until this point, Catherine had been entirely sober. Everything she'd done previously was teetotal. Isn't that mental? She laid a baby on the tracks, absolutely sober. She smashed an iron into someone's face and then stabbed him in the stomach. Completely sober. Mental. But when she met John, she started drinking a cheeky rum and coke every now and again, and she started to get loose. John was aware of Catherine's reputation, but he just couldn't stay away from her. John had children, and they were not overly thrilled with their dad dating Catherine, especially when she told them that she'd been abducted by aliens, and she would do things like purposely swerve to hit dogs in the road when the kids were in the car. And she also said that her uncle's ghost came to visit her. And I'm not shaming anyone claiming to know things about the paranormal world because, you know, I personally am not against that at all. But she is a crazy bitch. <laughs> Catherine also sat one of the girls down after school and told them that John wasn't actually her father and her mum had slept with someone else. And it was just to play mind games with her. The kids just had a super bad feeling about their potential stepmom. Catherine didn't help matters either when she stole some of John's money and she bought herself an engagement ring and forced him to propose. Fucking eep, mate. Like, <sighs> when John refused to marry her, Catherine was an absolute bitch and really fucked him over. You see, John was a minor and one of her other guys was also a minor. Like, Damn, she has a type, like David, David, John, John, minor, minor. John had worked his job for over 15 years. And during this time, he had taken some expired first aid supplies out of the bins at work so he could use them back at home. Catherine knew about John taking these supplies and she videoed them in the home as evidence and took them to his boss and then bragged about it to her next door neighbour that she'd really fucked John over. And as she predicted, as a result, and now 43-year-old John lost his job immediately and his pension that he'd worked 17 years for. Like, fuck. This man had worked the majority of his adult career to create this nest egg. And then this crazy bitch just comes along and just erases all of it. And it's all over some expired first aid supplies. So John was like, fuck this shit. He threw his papers up in the air and he left. And his friends were all like, yay, John, good for you, friend. And they were like, Catherine's crazy. You should never go back. And he was like, yeah, man, totally agree with you. But then he did, he went back. <laughs> and the thing is, we all know someone who's gone back to a relationship that they shouldn't have. And you have that moment where you literally face palm and you just think like, oh, you deserve so much more. Why don't you see that you deserve more than this? But they go back and it might be that they go back time and time again. Like I know people that have done it. I myself have done it. So I get it. But it's just hard as, a, as an outside looking in, you know? And when John went back to Catherine, she promised that this time it would be forever until death ominous. Things were obviously not plain sailing and Catherine didn't like John's kids and in my opinion I don't think she liked the attention that he gave them. John had already said that he was saving his house to give to his kids in his will and Catherine did not agree with that. She thought that she was entitled to the house because she's the one that cleans it and looks after it. John's friends later reported seeing what looked like bruises and scars and a potential stab wound to the chest. So Catherine was clearly beating John, like she had with her previous partners. Catherine then drunkenly told John's brother that she was gonna murder John and his kids. And then Catherine stabbed John in the chest again during a really bad argument. 
And she said she would only leave if he gave her $10,000. And John was like, nah, and went to the police to get a restriction order. But he was told that it would take around three weeks to get one issued. So John, against his friend's advice, went back home whilst the order was being put into place. You see, John was really worried about his kids. He was worried that if he didn't go back to the home, that Catherine would seek out his children and harm his children. John then told his friends, if I don't come into work tomorrow, then you know she's killed me. And the very next day, on February 29th, 2000, John was found dead and Catherine Knight had murdered him. Catherine planned out her entire day and how she would murder John. This was completely premeditated. She went and spent some time with her family where she supposedly wanted to make some home videos, almost like a goodbye video. And she recorded herself, sat out on the porch, and this is going to get weird, and she had her grandchildren sit on her knee. So this is all being recorded. And she then opened her blouse and encouraged them to play with her breasts while she sang about Nana's titty bops. What? <laughs> what is happening? She left her two kids there for the night and went on to a local thrift shop and bought a new sexy black nighty and headed on home to John at around 11.30pm and found that he was asleep. Catherine went in the shower. She got out. She put on her sexy new negligee and she woke John up for sex and then she struck. So after they finished having sex, John went to the bathroom to have a post-sex wee, nice and healthy, flush out the pipes. I'm a big ambassador for going for a wee after sex. But John didn't know that Catherine was getting her favourite boning knife ready. And as he was coming out the bathroom, she stabbed him in the chest. John tried to push her off of him, but she just kept stabbing. He managed to get past Catherine and he made it all the way to the front door. But Catherine just kept stabbing at him and dragged him back inside. And Catherine had stabbed John 37 times before he dropped down dead. And she'd stabbed him with a knife that she was renowned for keeping super sharp. Like, she adored these knives. They are in the best condition. So it's not like it was a blunt knife. It was like the sharpest. The amount of damage that that would do is insane. And if you think about the amount of blood splatter that it would create, like 37 stabs, it would be all up the walls and across the room. And I've seen the crime scene photo of the hallway and it's just covered in blood. So Catherine has killed John. So what do you do now? Well, Catherine thought back to her days at the abattoir and started to undress. She got totally naked. She set out her knives and she dragged John's body to her new preparation area and began to remove the skin. And remember, Catherine was renowned for her skills. And so she was able to remove all of John's skin in one full piece. She went across the back of the shoulders, down to the pubic region, around his genitals, down his legs, and she then connected those cuts down John's arms and across the top of his head. And she peeled his skin away from his body in one clean piece, including John's face. Catherine then hung the human pelt on a butcher's hook on the kitchen door. This is gnarly, and I'm sorry, it's a bad one. <laughs> this is why this case is so famous. So she now has his skinless corpse just laying on the floor. And she thinks back to her mother and how she used to boil a pig's head to make a stew. So Catherine got to work removing John's head. And once removed... She took the severed head through to the kitchen and started chopping up some veggies, including some squash, some potatoes and some cabbage. And she put it in the pot, along with some water and some spices and John's head. And she then preheated the oven and left the pot to boil. 
She then returned to the corpse, where she removed one of her favourite cuts of meat, the rump, and she cooked it in the oven. Once this feast was all ready to be served up, Catherine laid out some plates on the table and dished up the meal. And she put some place cards down where she wanted people to sit. And who was invited to dinner? She set places for John's children. And if this wasn't enough for you, Catherine then went back to John's skinless and headless body, picked him up and sat him in his usual place at the dinner table. She crossed his legs and she placed his hand around a glass of juice. And isn't that just a fucking horrific image in your mind? Like, Jesus Christ. John was just now, quite literally, a, just another piece of taxidermy in the house. John was known to be a heavy drinker, but his work ethic was insane. He was always the first one in at work. So when he didn't show up the next morning, his colleagues were immediately concerned and they called the police. When the police got to the home, they saw that the door handle was covered in blood. And one officer looked through the letterbox and, and said that they saw what they thought was a bunched up curtain hanging off the door, which later turned out to be John's skin. They then broke in through the back door and one investigator allegedly said that they went to move past the curtain and felt that it was wet and they looked down and saw blood and assumed that they'd injured themselves when breaking in through the back door. And then they saw John's face and realised that it was not a curtain. Can you even imagine? Like, I, I, I'm not a screamer. I don't normally scream. But I feel like I fucking scream at that. They then had to walk through the massacre to find Catherine in a comatose state on the bed, surrounded by pills. And when Detective Sergeant Bob Wells arrived on the scene, Catherine was being taken away by an ambulance to go to the hospital to get her stomach pumped. Bob later on suffered a nervous breakdown after seeing the crime scene and continues to have therapy. And one of the first officers on the scene actually quit his job because he just couldn't handle it and has continued to have night terrors ever since. When interviewed, Catherine claimed that she remembered nothing at all because of the pills. But she did recall stabbing John previously. She said that she was washing up, and he came at her, and she had a knife that she was cleaning. And she held it out, but he was closer than she realised, as she's only just gotten these new glasses, you see, so her eyesight wasn't that great. And so she did accidentally stab him this one time. And you can see this footage, I'll link it in the um, in the description, but there's a, a YouTube documentary where you get to see her being interviewed and she's just, she looks so normal. Like, you just look at her and think, oh, you know, she doesn't look scary, but she's mental. Catherine was obviously found guilty and she was in fact the first Australian woman that was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. She now lives out her life being referred to as the nanny by her other inmates and she manages prison events. She loves it. She loves being in prison. It's the happiest time of her life. Good for her. And that is the story of Catherine Knight. And one key point that I want to take away from this is that domestic abuse can be suffered by any person. And in this case, it was in a time and an area where the consensus was very much, women can't abuse men. Women don't hit men. Men can't be intimidated by women, etc, etc. And it makes people feel ashamed or too scared to ask for help and advice. And if you need to get help, then there are so many people out there that want to help you. I'll list a website down in the show notes for the National Domestic Violence Hotline. And you can call them 24 hours a day on 1-800-799-7233. I'll also list the YouTube documentary that I watched on the case in the notes, along with a book that I read called Man Eater by Ryan Green. And that goes more into the mind of Catherine, like how she manipulates people. And it was it was really interesting. I actually listened to it on Audible. Um, I listened to it over a, a few days. It's not too long, but um, yeah, it was it was pretty good to be fair. 
Also, shout out to the Morbid podcast who also covered the case because their episode was fantastic and it really helped me in my research. But let's take it back to the very beginning. How was my ale? Well, it is super unusual. Like, wow. I don't know what I was expecting, to be honest. It definitely has that raspberry punch to it, but I don't get any white chocolate or sort of like a milkshake vibe whatsoever. I've had milkshake IPAs in the past and they have been almost kind of like a, almost like a sort of like creamier stout kind of consistency. Whereas this one is very much a sort of thin ale with a raspberry tint. It's a nice novelty to try, but I wouldn't want to drink many of these. Like I certainly wouldn't buy a four pack or anything. You can find updates about new episodes over on Twitter and Instagram. And I'll be sure to post the photos of this case over on the Instagram page. And both pages can be found under Ale and Agony. If you want to support the show and you have some spare cash and you want to throw it at me, then you can find me over on Patreon at patreon.com slash Ale and Agony. And I will be sure to give you a shout out next episode because it's so appreciated. I would of course be super grateful for any feedback and maybe some more of those cheeky five star reviews over on Apple Podcasts. And thank you so much for spending this time with me. And well done on getting through to the end. This one was gnarly. <laughs> and I hope to catch you on the next episode. Goodbye, my friends. Mm-hmm.